few weeks ago, I was in Croatia with some of my buddies exploring the country. And for a lot of the little different adventures I did, I didn't take my phone or my camera uh, because I didn't want to lose it or to get lost. And so at one of those moments, I was kayaking through the Blue Cave. And so obviously I didn't want my phone to fall in the water uh, and wanted to just make sure, you know, to enjoy the moment. So I didn't take my phone. And because of that, I had no pictures. I didn't have anything to show to my family about what I was experiencing and what fun things I was doing. And so my first reaction was, why don't I find a picture online, you know, give them a sense of what I'm doing, get them a, a little feel for what's going on. And I kind of thought about why would I even have taken some pictures uh, oh, that I would find basically online? If I'm not in them, you know, how does anyone know it's me or it's different? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized it's because of the personal aspect of it. The picture that I would take would be my experience and the things that I'm wanting to share with my family, not just some random one online. And so I thought about how can I make this a little bit more personal and still give them an idea of what I was experiencing. So I used Meta's AI generating uh, image tool and generated an image of the Blue Cave in Croatia. So here's the actual picture that I shared with my family. Now, obviously, this doesn't look exactly like what I saw. Um, and it's, you know, AI generated, it's a little bit different, but I think that it did a really good job of showing my family a little glimpse of what I was doing while also making it uniquely personal. And I think that that aspect of enabling creative expression is something that's really exciting about AI generated media today. And so first there came mid journey, which came to the scene with image generation. And then a couple other players came in to fill this need of creative expression. Um, there was a mini evolution in the industry as well. First with playful cartoony stickers to then photorealistic images that continue to increase in quality and fidelity. And then finally, in this little evolution of creative expression came short form moments. And so with this came animations. And so at Meta, here's what we came up with from a product standpoint. Delivering high quality AI generated animation in just a few seconds. Now, in this talk, I'm going to share a bit more about how we pulled this off, including how we solve for some really tough challenges along the way. And so first, for a little bit of background, why is this actually hard to do? And so that part is threefold. The first being safety. Safety, there's a lot of coverage from government regulation to user reception, and it's a new space. We're definitely excited to be here and really excited to build responsibly here. We ensure that all of our media products have watermarks, both cryptographically and invisible, as well as visible, so that people can know when they're seeing this synthetic generated media, or if it's an authentic image that maybe someone else had taken. The other one is cost. Obviously, running these at scale on a lot of GPUs around the world can be really expensive, and even the cost of those themselves. And the third is scale. We have people using our products every day around the world. How can we make sure that we give these new tools to them in a way that's really accessible and is scalable? We don't want it so that if someone was to generate an image, they don't get anything back. We want them to always be able to get the excitement of asking for something and being able to receive it within our products. So scale is the one that we'll spend the majority of this talk discussing. I'm Gaurav Sharma, software engineer on Meta's generative AI team. And today in this talk, I'll be talking a bit about the way we launched the Animate product, the challenges we faced along the way, some of the novel model optimizations and infrastructures that we, in infrastructure changes we made to handle the scale. And then I'll also give a little peek into the future and see a little bit of what's next. So first, let's talk about optimization. So we utilized a lot of different optimization techniques to make our model one of the fastest in the industry, generating high quality animations in under five seconds. So there was quite a few different ones, but the two that I'm gonna focus on today was the use of Python predictor and guidance plus step distillation. So let's jump into the first one. So Python predictor. This one refers to the deployment and architecture changes and was two transformations that we actually did. The first of them was leveraging torch scripting and freezing. By converting the model from pure PyTorch to torch script, we achieved many automatic optimizations. These included continuous folding, fusing of multiple operations into one, and reducing the complexity of the computational graph. 
These three optimizations helped to increase inference speed, while freezing allowed even further optimization by reducing the number of dynamically computed values, and we were able to use constants instead. And while these were critical for our initial launch, we have continued to push the boundaries. For example, we have since migrated all of our media generation to use PyTorch 2.0. This is a change from the TorchScript solution that I just mentioned. And so some background on PyTorch 2 before we jump into it even a little more. So there's two types of execution, eager execution and graph execution. Eager execution is when we evaluate the operations immediately and at runtime. These ones are typically easy to write, easy to test, and debug. And they usually have a Python-like syntax design. However, because of its nature, it fails to fully leverage the capabilities of hardware accelerators like GPUs, which have been continuing to get better and better every day. PyTorch is a common example that follows eager execution. The other one is graph execution. Graph execution, on the other hand, builds a graph of all the operations and operands before running. Such an execution is much faster than an eager one because the graph can be formed in a way to optimize and leverage the capabilities of these hardware accelerators and nice GPUs. However, such programs take much more work to write and debug. TensorFlow is a typical example that follows graph execution. And so continuing on about that, uh, PyTorch 2 provided a few new things uh, that build up the optimizations we get from it. So the first of it is Torch Dynamo. This allows for the PyTorch program to acquire graphs with 99% safety, without errors, and negligible overhead. The second one is AO2 Autograd. And so this is the new PyTorch Autograd engine that generates ahead of time backward traces. Another one we leveraged is the OpenAI uh, deep learning based compiler known as Torch Inductor. And so this allows for generating fast code for multiple accelerators and backends and is really useful. And so the next part is Torch Compile. This is one that really allowed us to build up some of the optimizations. And it has three main parts, the first being graph acquisition. The model is broken down and rewritten into subgraphs. The subgraphs can then be compi compiled or optimized and are then flattened. And so the subgraphs that can't be uh, optimized or flattened, we just run those back in the eager model, but we still get the benefits of the ones that can. The second part is graph flowing. All PyTorch operations are decomposed into their chosen backend uh, specific kernels, and this makes it really easy to use. And then finally, graph compilation. All the backend kernels uh, call their corresponding low-level operations, and we're able to do that really efficiently. And so this ultimately allows us to drastically reduce the complexity of the graph, making our products much faster and reducing the latency. The next optimization is guidance and step distillation. And so this one is more of an advanced strategy in machine learning, particularly in the context of trained diffusion models for tasks like conditional image generation and uh, animations. And so let's break this down into the two optimization strategies mentioned, step distillation and guidance distillation. Um, so first one, step distillation. This is a technique used to compress the knowledge from a larger model, the teacher, into a smaller model, the student, over fewer training steps. Here's how it works. Initialization. Both the teacher and student models are initialized with the same weights. This ensures that they start with the same knowledge base. Then, for the training objective, the student model is trained not just to replicate the output of this teacher model at each step, but to encapsulate multiple steps of the teacher as a single step of the student. This means that the teacher model takes multiple steps to reach a certain level of understanding or output quality. The student is expected to do it in much fewer steps. And so the efficiency here is we've essentially compressed the knowledge and capabilities of a more complex model into a simpler one with fewer operational steps. This leads to faster inference times and reduced computational costs during deployment. The second optimization is guidance, is guidance distillation. And so guidance distillation is particularly relevant in the context of diffusion models and for conditional media generation. Diffusion models typically require multiple forward passes based on the different conditions. So for the unconditional pass, we generate a baseline piece of media without any conditions. And then for us, we used two conditional passes, an, an image conditional and a full conditional, which was text plus image. And so this generates images based on the specific conditions. And then in a traditional setup, 
Each solver step in the diffusion process would require separate forward passes for each condition type, significantly increasing computational load. So the optimization here is that we make it one single forward pass. We simplify the process by combining all three conditional and unconditional forward passes into a single forward pass, drastically decreasing the computational overhead while reducing the number of steps from three to one, tripling the efficiency of the model. And so the real magic here, though, is when we combine these two techniques. So we do call this guidance plus step distillation. And so it has three main parts, a unified training approach, which is training the student model to not only perform multiple teacher steps in one go, but also integrate the classifier free guidance into a single forward pass. This makes the training and inference processes highly efficient. The second is reducing the solver steps. The final student model for us requires significantly fewer solver steps, going from 32 to 8 in the example here. And each step just involves one forward pass through the model's unit architecture. And so the combined approach here not only reduces the computational load and speeds up inference, but also simplifies the model architecture without sacrificing any performance. The student model learns to perform these complex conditional media generation with fewer steps and fewer total resources. And so now let's talk a little bit about scalability. The three parts that I'm going to touch on a little bit today are traffic management, GPU allocation, and load testing. We'll dive a little bit more into traffic management and do a little deep dive. But so first, let's talk about GPU allocation. We didn't know how much usage this Animate product was going to get when we started. So we use estimations based on the Imagine product, the image generation product we launched at Metis Connect in 2023, and use that to get some estimates on what amount of GPUs we would need and where we should allocate those. We then ran load testing, and we simulated traffic from different regions to these models. And then based on the bottlenecks, we addressed the issues that occurred. And then finally, let's jump into the deep dive for traffic management. So for traffic management, we implemented a new system for routing. And so basically what we do is we define some metrics for our tiers. And this metric is something we just decided on our own was something that we wanted to optimize for. And so we fetch that value from each of the tiers machines and we aggregate it by region. We then collect the number of requests per second that each region sends to every other region. And we use that to calculate the request per second load cost. This basically tells the system that for every added request per second, the load will increase by X amount. And so once this is complete, then the algorithm begins. First, by bringing all the traffic to the source region, we don't yet check if the region actually has enough capacity yet. That comes a little bit later. The next step is to enter a loop where, during every iteration, we look at which region is running closest to maximum capacity. The service tries to take a chunk of that and offload it to a nearby region that can handle it without becoming overloaded itself. And so depending on the level of overload, we decide how many regions and which nearby regions we will offload traffic to. In the example of my diagram, if the main region is only just starting to run hot, only the closest regions might be utilized. But if we're getting closer to maximum capacity, we might start overloading to further and further away regions, and those will be unlocked for offloading traffic. Finally, we'll exit the loop when there's no more requests that can be moved between regions with um, out increasing the everyone to over the threshold or when every region is below the defined threshold. At this point, the service will then calculate the optimal number of requests per second for each region, and we use that to create a routing table. And so that allows for our service to appropriately determine where to send traffic at request time and make sure the users get a fast and successful result. When we were doing this, we noticed there was quite a few amount of errors. And so at a high level, each GPU can only actively work on one request at a time because it fully saturates the GPU. And so to maintain fast latency, we made sure that we don't let requests queue up. We don't want tons of people waiting for other requests to happen first uh, before they can get theirs. It will result in a really long wait time. So to enforce this, we made sure that the server load, which was the queued requests plus the ones that are actively being run, is at most one. And the server would reject new requests uh, at that time. Because of this, however, when we were running near a capacity limit, we'll run into a number of failures. The naive solution here would be use a queue, but that presents its own set of complex challenges to being efficient and fast due to having to load balance globally. What we used instead was approximating by creating a probing system that abuses retries. By doing that, we were able to check if a GPU is free really fast and prevent some failures. 
Now, this worked really well before we implemented the traffic management system that I mentioned before. The system, while effective at reducing latency, introduced more complications by reducing the number of available hosts, and we no longer had the ability to do global routing. We noticed that the retry polling was no longer being helpful uh, when there was any spikes, and it would tend to cascade. And further investigation led us to discover that we needed to optimize our settings for retries. It had no delay nor back off, so if we had a region where lots of tasks were trying to run, it was stuck overloading until it started failing requests. To avoid the cascading errors, we modified these retry settings to get a marginal executional delay um, at execution time, and they became gradually available to run instead of all at once, as well as an exponential back off. This resulted in us really reducing the number of errors and making a really stable product. And so now what's next? We're really looking forward to continue to innovate with Gen AI features, and in order to do so, we'll need to continue to innovate technically for making our models higher quality as well as faster and more efficient. And this will enable more use cases and more creative expression opportunities we will give the people that use our products every day. We're really excited about giving people control on what's occurring in the animations and making them even longer so that these stories and expression can get even deeper. And so some takeaways from this talk is the first being build for people. Everything we're building here is to make sure that we can enhance the creative expression opportunities we give the people that use our products every day. Just like I mentioned with using it to share with my family, the Blue Cave in Croatia, to so many different other use cases that we probably haven't even discovered yet. And the second is that these products are evolving at a really rapid rate. And there's a lot of opportunity in this space and it's really exciting. And then finally, at the scale that Meta operates, Efficiency is really a priority. We need to make sure that throughout the stack, from our models to our infrastructure to our apps, that we really focus on that and make sure it's at high, as high quality as possible. Would love to see the way you guys use generative AI media. So feel free to reach out to me on Facebook or the email listed. And thanks for taking the time to listen to me today about AI-generated animations at Meta. And really appreciate the time.